can you tell? There's a little bit of sand, a little sand coming out of his ear. I, I, I noticed that. So a um, couple things real quick before we dive into Jonah. And for some of you, just get a head start now. Find Jonah in the Old Testament. It's what we call the clean pages of your Bible. A um, couple of things. One is um, for our life groups. So we do two things throughout the year. One is a, is a couple installments of life groups. This is where we come together at someone's home and meet, grow closer to God, grow closer to one another, and just live life on life. And then when we take a break from our life groups, we do a, uh, an installment of growth groups, which are more topic-focused. And so we will be offering some growth groups May, June, usually I lead one, uh, Elder Norm leads one, we get a couple other people to lead some, so more topic-based, so stay tuned from so, for some announcements uh, regarding those. If you open your outline in your, in your program, you'll notice at the bottom of the outline there's a section at the very bottom called Core Competencies. Uh, we believe that there are 10 beliefs, 10 virtues, and 10 practices that every follower of Jesus should be involved in. And every week, uh, my message touches on uh, a series of those things. And part of what the life groups do and the growth groups do is, is, is funnel us towards learning those beliefs, uh, practicing the practices, and, and uh, living out of those virtues. And so, uh, if you ever want to know what's Pastor Scott going to be talking about today, well, those core competencies are going to be touching on those things. So, uh, just for you to be aware of that. Also, uh, after the service, something we want to do more often is just uh, make prayer available. I never know how God, and we never know how God's going to stir your hearts during the music, during the message, and you just may want to just to talk to somebody or pray with somebody. So, after the service today, right over on this side, we're going to have uh, Mike and Tim available. There are a couple of deacons. Mike, raise your hand. And Tim, they're just going to be available over here after the, after the service. And on this side, we're going to have Kevin and Donna fake Raise your hands. And just after the service ends, if you just desire just to have someone just pray for you and just someone to talk to, they're going to be available for you. So I just want to make mention of that. So um, let's pray. We'll dive into Jonah. Father, thanks for this morning. Thank you for being so faithful to us, for giving us this new morning to be together. We are just thrilled that you would be a God to show us so much love and grace and, and kindness. It is, a, it is truly a, a privilege to be here, not just with one another, but most importantly before you, Father. Be glorified in this time. Engage our hearts. Speak to our, our, our spirits today. And just thank you for loving us the way you do in Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Jonah chapter 3 is where we're going to be, so turn there if you would. Um, in case you guys didn't know, uh, what I do during the week uh, I don't just work on Sundays, uh, much to a lot of people's misunderstanding, right? Like, what do you do during the week? I wish I was out on the golf course all the time or mountain biking, but I, I meet people, I, uh, I mentor people, I counsel people, I prepare the message every Sunday, and usually where you'll find me during the week is right here. Uh, because I need copious amounts of caffeine to stay functioning every single day. Uh, but if I'm ever here, you guys can always come and drop in. My, I have an open door policy. And if you find me here, grab a seat. Let's talk. Let's catch up. And so, um, but while I'm here, sometimes I'll bring materials to, to study and prepare my message. And so a lot of our customers at the coffee house know I'm a pastor. I'm the coffee house pastor is an interesting title. Um, but they'll, they'll just kind of come up to me and kind of go, you know, what, hey, what are you, what are you doing? What, what are you working on? That's just an open door, right, to just start talking to them about Jesus or share with them what I'm, what I'm working on. And so I had a guy this past week. I was sitting here on one of the couches, and I was looking at Jonah, and uh, he just kind of came up to me and said, hey, what, what are you working on? you preparing Sunday's message? I was like, yeah. He goes, what are you going to be speaking on? I said, well, we're doing uh, a series in the minor prophets of the Old Testament. And immediately this guy went to all oh, the Old Testament, hellfire brimstone, right? <laughs> and I said, that is funny you would say that. Because when you think about the Bible, and if you're familiar with the Bible, and especially the, the two sections, Old and New Testament, most people 
Go to that place where the God of the Old Testament is just a God who's angry. A God who is just looking to wipe out people and be mean and cruel. Much like this customer shared with me this past week, right? Hellfire brimstone. And then the God of the New Testament is a God of kindness and gentleness. And it's like we worship two different gods. And I'm going to tell you right now that we don't worship two gods. We worship one God who has made himself known in the Old and New Testament. But what I told this customer, I said, you would think that, but you'd be amazed how how kind and how wonderfully gentle the God of the Old Testament is. So many times we want to paint God in this light where it's like he's hellfire brimstone. He's looking but to no, do nothing but take your joy, ruin your life, and kill as many people as possible. And this is not true. The person who tells me that is a person who is ignorant of the God of the Old Testament. He is a God, as we're going to see today in Jonah, who is ever so patient, ever so compassionate, ever so kind to us, that, you know what, we need to once again see this picture of this God who loves us even when we are unlovable. That's the amazing thing about it, is that that God is faithful when we're faithless, and he loves us even when we're unlovable. Have you ever been unlovable? Anyone here today? Today you're a little bit unlovable? I guess you're in the right place. Jonah chapter 3 and 4. That's where we're going to be today. So turn your Bibles, if you would, there. And we're going to notice two things in this section of Scripture today. First is, we're going to lean on God's kindness, because that's a great place to camp out. We're going to consider some wonderful truths about God's kindness. And then we're going to learn in chapter 4... From Jonah's anger, Jonah, most of us know as the prophet who was swallowed by a great fish, we, uh, what we don't know is a little bit more of the, the backstory that even we unpacked last week. He's also known as the reluctant prophet. He's also known as the angry prophet. He's also known as the argumentative prophet. He's also known as the pouting prophet. I, don't, I could go on. But you're sitting there looking at a character like this, and how much more than just this dude being swallowed by a big fish, this is a guy who is used by God, but he's very unlovely in who he is. He started out well, we we saw that last week in 2 Kings chapter 14, but it just seems like God gave us this book of Jonah to, to show us maybe a little bit about ourselves, why sometimes we defy God, why sometimes we rebel against God, and, and even in our disobedience, God still shows us kindness. Can you imagine? And we turn to Jonah, and we're going to look at chapter 3 and 4. So he's already tried to, to go the opposite way of God's will. We know how that turned out, right? He, God sent a storm. The sailors threw Jonah overboard. A, a great fish came and rescued Jonah just the right minute. Chapter 2 is like the salvation prayer, like God praising God, uh, Jonah praising God. And now we come to chapter 3, and you would think that Jonah learned his lesson, but he doesn't. As a matter of fact, it's amazing how chapter 3 and 4 really in structure are like chapter 1 and 2. Because what you're going to see in chapter 3 and 4 is God commissioning Jonah to do a work. Jonah actually this time doing what God wants, but he's going to do it half-heartedly. And the final chapter of Jonah, instead of ending like with a, with a prayer of praise that God's good, it's going to end, end on an angry note. Jonah is going to be upset about God doing what God has promised to do. Like Jonah's upset that God's going to be God. And we're going to see and learn, I hope, from Jonah's anger. Because I'm going to tell you something, I'm going to repeat it later. And I learned this from one of my mentors a long time ago. God is too kind to be cruel, too wise to ever make a mistake, and too deep to explain himself. Write that down. And no, I didn't pick that up at Panda Express in my fortune cookie the other day. Like, that's good. You ever get a fortune cookie and you're like, they're ripping off scripture. They're they're ripping off Christian quotes now, right? Wouldn't be a bad thing, right? But a mentor told me this years ago, and I'll never forget it. God is too kind to be cruel, too wise to ever make a mistake, and too deep to explain himself. And we have to be okay with this. 
Because the moment you're not okay with that is the moment you start getting angry. Because the God who truly is, is not going to be like the God you fashion after your own image. And the God who is, is never going to live up to the expectations you want of the God that you've designed. And hence, frustration and anger will set in. You have to be okay in a God who is too deep to explain himself. You have to be okay with a God who is too kind to be cruel. He may not execute the person you want executed. He may not act in the world you may not want him to act like, but you have to trust that he's a God who is sovereign, who knows what he's doing. And often, and and C.S. Lewis said it so well, he said, God has made man in his image and we have returned the favor. Right? We want a manageable deity We want a God that we can mold and shape and make to serve our purposes. And instead of worshiping the God who is, we we think we're comfortable with the God that we've created and that's never true. And this this is true about Jonah. Jonah is not the account of a great fish. Jonah is the account of a great God. And a great God who uses fallible people like Jonah, like you and I. Amen? So two things this morning. We're going to lean on God's kindness. And secondly, we're going to learn from Jonah's anger. First and foremost, leaning on God's kindness. And in chapter 3, his kindness is written all over this account. There's three things we're going to look at. We're going to look at a great calling. We're going to look at a great city. And we're going to see a great change. So we pick up the scene. Jonah has just been vomited up by the great fish. All right? Can you imagine the sight? I don't know what it's like to spend time in the belly of a great fish, but there's, there's gastric acids involved. Right? I think we, we kind of sterilize scripture, and we don't think about the fact that maybe his skin being in the fish for three days is bleached because of the acid. We don't think about the fact that maybe he smells a little bit because he was not only inside the fish, but there's other stuff inside the fish. He was probably not a charming person to look at. He was probably not a charming person to be, be around. But all I know is that he is on the beach. He's probably smelly. He probably looks disgusting. And once again, God calls him on that beach, verse 1, chapter 3, and says this, Jonah, I've got a mission for you. See, this is, this is the remarkable thing about God's calling on our lives. He knows we're going to mess up. He knows we're going to fail. He knows we're going to be disobedient. And yet God doesn't just give us one strike and say we're out. God comes back to us and says, get up, let's go at it again. Isn't that cool? To know that we are in the company of men and women throughout history who have failed, who have fallen down, and for some strange reason God says, get on up, we're going to go at it again. Abraham lies. Moses kills. David cheats. Peter denies. I mean, we are part of this great host of people who are mistake-filled, and God still uses them. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Don't miss the importance of that word, a second time. Aren't you glad God's the God of second chances? Aren't you glad God's the God of third chances? How many of you are on number 89 right now? Just curious. How many are in the thousands, perhaps, right? See, these are the EGR cases, extra grace required. This is, this is what we need to hear, that God is a God who says, once I call you, you need to know you are mine forever. Once I call you, you can still be used forever. Just because you have one incident that you may consider a failure, one, you may have one mistake that you've done, and the rest of the world may write you off, God says, if you're mine, I will use you forever. He's a God who restores. As someone who has not had a perfect record in in ministry, and I have made mistakes, guess what? It is a comforting thing to know that God says, Scott, I can still use you. And you need to know that. That the world may kick you and and scratch you and bite at you and and want to keep you down, but there's a God who says, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Learn from your past. Grow from your mistakes. Learn the lessons God wants you to have. But never let your failures immobilize you for God's service. 
Amen. We're done. Let's go home, okay? God comes to Jonah and says, guess what? Jonah, I've got a mission for you, and it hasn't changed, right? I called you in chapter one, and you went the opposite direction, so let's try this again. Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to all the people there that which I'm going to tell you. I've got a message, and I want you to share it with this great city. So Jonah rose and went to Nineveh. Okay, we're starting on the right foot. Right? He's doing what God wants him to do. And and I'm going to just, let me just say something so important here. God's work is so important. But you know what's more important than God's work? God's workers. Okay? God is more concerned about you than he is his work that he wants to do through you. Okay? He wants to know that you have a receptive heart. He wants you to know, he wants to know that you have an obedient heart. He is a God who wants his workers to be everything that he wants them to be before they set up. The work is important, but the heart of the worker is that much more important. And you need to know that when I talk to church leaders, when I meet with leadership here at Missy O'Day, and I, and I mentor uh, people here that are part of the, the team, my number one agenda item is how are you doing? Not like, hey, Jacob, make sure you get that violinist for the band. It would be cool to have a violin, wouldn't it? I didn't say accordion. I, I know the Lord. I know the difference between really good sound and bad sound. I don't meet with Ryan and be like, hey, Ryan, make sure next quarter we've got 50 small groups meeting. Uh, you know, My concern is not about the work. My primary concern is about the worker. And you can ask these guys, Jacob, Ryan, we meet once a week. I want to know how they're doing. And I praise God I got the chance to meet with my mentor this past week, 85-year-old pastor up in Scottsdale. We meet every few weeks, and I tell you what, his number one concern is my heart. And you know what he always asks me? Right now, Scott, what's discouraging you in ministry? Right now, Scott, what's encouraging you in ministry? He's not asking me, like, hey, how many is your church running on Sundays? Because that is not important. This man knows that you can have successful ministry numbers, ABCs, attendance, buildings, cash. That does not matter. What matters is the heart of the worker. Amen? Jonah gets up, goes to Nineveh. We know it's about a 500-mile trip, so who knows? It may have taken him a month. We don't know. The writer of Jonah does not give us the details, but he goes and does what the Lord says. So here's a great calling to do the Lord's work, but never forsake your heart in doing the Lord's work. Be the person God wants you to be. And so he goes, and Nineveh, it says in verse 3, was an exceedingly great city at three days' walk. Now, I talked about this last week, and I'm going to tell you that it was a big metropolitan city. And the, the population numbers um, are, are different when it comes to historians uh, understanding how big the city was. But what we can gather from what we know is that Jonah went throughout the city. He went to all the neighborhoods, all the districts, and it would have taken you three days to cover the entire place to saturate with the message of, of, that God wanted Jonah to take. Verse 4. So Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, 40 days Nineveh will be overthrown. In the original language, this is a five-word sermon. Some of you wish I had five-word sermons, don't you? Know that Jonah probably said more than just five words, but what the writer of Jonah wants us to know is that he, he shared five words with the city. Nineveh will be overthrown. And the city's going to change as a result of his message. Now, Jonah didn't preach his message. Jonah preached the message God wanted him to preach. And I'm going to tell you right now, when you do what God wants you to do, when you say what God wants you to say, here's what you don't need to be concerned about is the results. Because what you're going to see in verse 5 through verse 10 is that the city 
is going to heed the warning, repent, and turn their hearts to God. This is a pagan nation. This is a people who are cruel, who are malicious, they are violent, they do not want God, but yet this prophet comes in probably looking pretty disgusting, probably smelling pretty disgusting. He doesn't speak their language. He has nothing to do with their culture. He is from Israel, but he brings the message of the one true God, and he doesn't waver on the message. He tells it just like God told him to tell them, and they change. First, what I want you to consider is this this point of a great city. Notice throughout Jonah, Nineveh is called a great city. And I'm going to tell you that it wasn't a great city necessarily because of its size. It wasn't a great city because of its uh, military prowess. I'm going to tell you that the reason God calls it a great city is because he loves people. And no matter where you go in this world, God is using you like he's using Jonah to take the message about him loving people and every city then is great city. Amen? Phoenix is a great city. And you know, want to know why? It's not because we have amazing downtown. It's not because we have amazing food. We have amazing culture. People are from so many different places in the country, in the world. This is a great city because there are men and women created in the image of God here who have an opportunity to turn their hearts to Him. That's why this is a great city. And and probably one of the biggest points I want you to take away this morning is this. No matter where God takes you, He's going to take you to a great job tomorrow. And you want to know why that job's great? Not because of the pay scale. Not because of your responsibilities. That job is great because you're going to rub elbows with somebody who doesn't know God yet. And you're going to be the very instrument that perhaps tells them about God. You're going to go to a great school tomorrow. You're going to live in a great neighborhood today. You're going to drive on great freeways. You want to know why? Not because structurally these are sound things. But because these are places where men and women exist who are ignorant of God and they need to hear about God. See, there's a great calling on our lives to live in a manner worthy of our calling in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. And God has us in great locations to share about an even greater God who loves them. Never forget the mission. God does not call us to go to church. He calls us to be the church. And your obedience to God, while it may not matter much right now, what matters more is what you do with what you know beyond this time and place right now. Am I preaching now? You better believe it. Because I'm going to share with you stories as I live my life, making myself available to people, whether it be the coffee house, whether it be my neighborhood, whether it be the grocery store, opportunities to share the love of God with people because we live in a great world that is created by a great God and there are people that are inhabiting this planet that are worshiping falsely. They don't know God yet and we want to redirect their hearts to the one God who is worthy of all adoration, praise, and worship. So there's a great calling, there's a great city, and notice the change, verse 5. And the people of Nineveh believed God, and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. And when the word of God reached the king, the highest courts, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe, and covered himself with sackcloth and sat on ashes. Is that awesome? This is the most powerful man in the ancient Near East at this time. And he hears the message of God's impending judgment and he lays aside any symbolism of his regality and he sits upon ashes clothed now with sackcloth. Itchy, hard fabric as a symbol of brokenness and repentance. You don't think God can work? Even through a reluctant prophet? Even with a man whose heart isn't entirely wholly buying into what God wants? He still does it. And look what happens. So never think about you got to be the perfect person at the perfect time in the perfect place to do God's work. Amen? God can use even an ass like he does in the Bible, all right? And that's many of us sometimes. Amen? So he goes to this place and he does an incredible work. Because he sees the need all around him. He may not buy into how God wants going to work. Because Nineveh, this this region where Jonah's... These these are Israel's enemies. These are vicious people. These are the last people that Jonah wants to go visit. 
But he does it anyways, however reluctantly, and God begins to work. I'm going to tell you something, you know, there is need all around us, and it doesn't matter if you're talking to the king or you're talking to the lowest servant. People need Jesus. People need to be delivered. They need to be rescued. I was impacted by a documentary that I watched several months ago. It actually won an Academy Award uh, this, this past Oscar season called The White Helmets. Raise your hand if you've seen it. If, not, if you haven't seen it, watch it today. Best 45 minutes of your, of your I'm going to say, part of the year. Syrian civilian team of men who are living in Aleppo where there's frequent bombing going on in their city. And their sole task is to watch where the explosions are happening and to rush in and pull out any survivors out of the wreckage as possible. They don white helmets with cameras on them. And that's the name of the, 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 the documentary, the white helmets. This is a team of people who do not get paid, but they do it because they care about their fellow countrymen. And you see first-hand footage of a decimation having just taken place and them going in and trying to pull out as many survivors as possible. And to see the eagerness and the intensity and the energy of these men who some have lost family members because of the, the, the bombings, devoting them their lives to saving people blows me away. And I sit there and go, here are men who are rescuing people physically because they are being harmed. And I'm wondering about the church today, even though we are not facing bombings in our country, praise God for that. What about the people that are dying every day without Christ? Are we not called to be like the white helmets, right? And going in and rescuing people. You may not agree with them, you may not like them, but God does not ask you if you agree with them or like them. God asks you, do you care for them and do you love them? Because if you've been shown a great love and you've been extended great care and mercy, how dare you hold that back from people who are desperately dying without it? Jonah goes in. The king responds. And not just the king, but all these other people in the country, even down to the animals. So for all you animal lovers, this, this is a part for you right here. That even the animals in Assyria were forced to go into mourning and repentance. Look at verse 7. So he issued this proclamation, the king did, in Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water. This is a nationwide fast. Even the animals, and both man and beast, must be covered with sackcloth. So it's not just humans now. It's like, okay, pony, come on over here. We're putting sackcloth on you. Come here, little, you know, little pigs. Like, here, there's a sackcloth for you. Every living creature was covered. This is called thorough repentance. This is a nation who's taking the message of God seriously. And even the king in verse 9 says, Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. He's like, I'm not going to take a chance. I'm going to heed the message of Jonah. We're going to turn our hearts to God. In verse 10, when God saw their deeds that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. If you want to write down a, a corollary passage, Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 7 through 10, talks about the ways God interacts with people on a daily basis, and he says, if you continue in your wicked way, there is judgment. But if you turn your hearts to me, I am a God who will relent and not bring judgment your way. This is why Jesus in Matthew says, the people of Nineveh will be a constant, consistent witness of the judgment of God, that these people's hearts were broken because God says, I will bring judgment unless you turn your hearts to me. They turned their hearts to God and they were spared. And, and Jesus says, just like those people turned, you need to look to Jesus. He says, look to me, who like Jonah would be in the, in the, in the grave three days, three nights. 
but I will be your refuge. I will be your salvation. And Jesus says the people of Nineveh will stand as a witness against you if you continue in your erring ways. Isn't that amazing? The people of Nineveh changed. God used a reluctant prophet to change the course of their lives. Awesome. But just as if you think this story is going to end there on a, on a positive note, this is one of those bittersweet moments in the Bible. You guys know about my bittersweet interest in movies? My, the movies I love don't always have to end on a good note. My wife hates it. She's like, I hope this ends well. And when it doesn't, she's like, I'm going to bed. And it's like the silent treatment for 24 hours. Like, life sometimes doesn't work out that well, right? On a day-to-day -day basis, you're not always going to bed like, man, it was just such an awesome day filled with roses and wine and yellow brick roads and this and that. It's not always like this. The prophet Jonah ends on a downer note. Because here's a man who's angry at God. He's not celebrating the change in the city. He's not rejoicing over the fact that there were those who were lost who have now been found. There were those blind that now see. He begins to have a little pity party because he's so in love, not with the city, but himself. And he gets angry. Look at verse 1, chapter 4. And it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. I mean, Luke 15 says when one person turns from their wicked ways to God, there's a party in heaven. Here are thousands upon thousands of people who turn from their wicked ways to God, and here's the prophet, angry. There's so much self-love, there's so much selfishness in this man's heart, that he cannot see a time to rejoice because things haven't worked out his way. Do you know people like that? Let's keep it at knowing people like that and not admitting we're the kind of people like that. Is that, is that. That's safe, isn't it? Like, when things don't go our way, we get ticked. We have a hissy fit. We get pissed off. We get angry. We get frustrated. Why? Because we go about our daily routine with expectations. We have expectations on one another. We have expectations on our spouse, on our kids, on our boss, on our coworkers, on other drivers that occupy the same freeway we, we travel on. We have expectations on God. And the moment someone doesn't live up to our expectations, it sets us off. Yeah. Right? I'll tell you, when my wife and I, when we have those moments of disagreement and we fight, it is because of either a false or unannounced expectation. All of a sudden I know, you know, my wife's got a little bit of crawl on her and she's like, you know, picking on me about something. I'm like, what's going on here? Well, you didn't do this. And I go, I didn't know I was supposed to. Notice this is about her being angry and not about me being angry. And she's not here to defend herself, so don't tell her, all right? I'll change it second service when she's here, so. Don't get angry with me. Well, we're expecting you to tell her. Well, don't get your expect the false expectations, all right? It will be about Norm next service, so. <laughs> well, were you going to tell me this is what you expected of me? Because, number one, I'm not a mind reader. And number two, we just need to talk. So if you want something done, let me know. And how many times people don't know, and when they don't live up to our assumed expectations, guess what happens? Conflict. And here's the problem. It's not that even that we have unannounced expectations. We have expectations no one could ever meet. Couples who get married and she or he is like, oh, they're just going to make me happy the rest of my life. I'm going, wow, this thing is doomed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to marry you because you're going to bring me nonstop happiness. Wow. Are, are, you are you marrying somebody who like farts rainbows? And, and like, I want to meet this kind of person that's going to make you infinitely happy forever. Because in that person's mind, right, the moment you don't make me happy, we're, we're, we're going to get a divorce. Yeah. <laughs> right? But think about this when it comes to our relationship with God. 
Because if we begin to make God after our own image and the God we want, not the God who is, the moment he fails to live up to your expectations is the moment you are just going to continue to walk in the spiritual angriness. That is a made-up word. We're allowed to do that once in a while here at Missio Day. Spiritual angriness. Because what we fail to do, like Jonah did, we assume we know God. And when you assume you know everything you possibly know about God and you can kind of predict the way he's going to act or you're going to kind of manipulate him to act the way you want him to act is the moment you really don't know God at all. Four things concerning uh, Jonah's anger that we need to learn from. He failed to understand God's nature. He failed to understand God's grace. He failed to understand God's sovereignty. And he failed to understand God's mercy. Notice verse 2. He, he just he lays it out there. He gets angry. He prays to the Lord, verse 2, and says, Please, Lord, was this not what I said while I was still in my old country? So, see, not only is he getting historical, he's getting hysterical, which sometimes are, are, are two of the same things, right? He's getting mad because he's like, it's my word versus your word. You called me, remember back chapter one? Well, I was right, and I'm only doing what you asked me to do now because you're asking me to do it, but my heart's not totally in it, and you need to remember. So he's defending his words versus God's words. This is a dead-end battle, right? Like, he thinks he's going to win an argument with the Almighty. You don't remember, Lord? You, you forgot? Verse two. He says, therefore, in order to forestall this, you being kind to people, because here's really what Jonah's thinking. Like, you know what? I went and I told them you were going to bring judgment unless they turned to you. And I ultimately did not want them to turn to you because guess what? I like the privileges you give me. and I don't want to share those privileges with anybody else. Totally selfish. And I knew how you would treat them. And I didn't want them to have what I have. So therefore, I went the other way. But I know, and he says, and here's where his confession comes in of of knowing the nature of God. I know that you are a gracious and compassionate God who is slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and one who relents concerning calamity. Can I tell you? That is such a true theological statement. But simply because it's a true theological statement doesn't mean it's coming from a true worshipful heart. There are people who can quote the Nicene Creed. There are people who can quote the Westminster Shorter Catechism. There are people that can quote different theological positions. But I'll tell you what, there are people that are so heady when it comes to the things of God that their heart is detached from it and they don't live out what they say they believe. Do not be those kind of people. Do not be the people who walk around in spiritual snobbery and go, well, I know Jesus, and I know the scriptures, and I only go to Christian films, and I only listen to Christian music, and I know a lot about God. But they don't show love to a person who is desperate need of salvation in Jesus. Don't become the ivory tower Christian where in the alleys and in the, the battle zones and in the, in the, in the um, when you're fighting in a, in a pit, trenches, <laughs> sounds like two syllables. <laughs> Don't be the person who knows a lot and doesn't act on what you know. You are no better than the person in Matthew 7 that stands before God and says, did we not do these things? And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. Because it doesn't matter how much you know, knowledge puffs up, but it is love that edifies. Jonah thought he knew all about God. He thought he knew how God would act. He thought he knew how God, because these people were evil. There's no way they could ever turn to God. He had already written them off. And yet he didn't understand God's nature. That God is powerful enough to turn the most wicked human heart into soft, pliable putty that that person who once hated him now loves him. He did it to me. 
And for some of you, He did in your life. And you know where you came from. You knew the kind of person you were. And only by the grace of God did He step in and do something phenomenal in your life. Amen? Do not get to the place where you think you got God figured out. Because that's the moment I sit there and go, you know nothing about God. It will take eternity to plumb the depths of God's nature. People go, what are we going to do for forever in eternity in heaven with God? Because there's only so many songs I can play on the harp, and there's only so many places I can fly with my little angel's wings, right? You will ta- it will take f- eternity to plumb the depths of God, and just when you think you've, you've done it, you've only scratched the surface. Amen? He failed to understand God's grace. Verse 3, Therefore, O Lord, please take my life. Death is better than me than life. Like, he's like, I'm so miserable. I'm so discouraged. Like, just take me out of this world. And notice, notice how kind God is. Like, if I was God, and thank goodness I'm not, I'd be like, fine. <laughs> right? Let's just take you out. Like, that's what you want? Fine. Have attitude. I'm going to take you out. But instead, look at verse 4. And the Lord said, do you have good reason to be angry? Like, stop right there, because not only is God going to ask Jonah this question this one time, he's going to ask it again in a few verses, more verses. Just stop, and do you really have any reason to be angry? And I'm going to tell you right now that this is probably one of the most simple tests of character for any man or woman. Let me follow up with a couple other questions. What makes you happy? Write that down. What makes you happy? Second question, profound, I know. What makes you sad? Because these are important questions to discuss. Because the things that make you happy and the things that make you sad are going to be a really a true, true revelation of what's going on in your heart. Do you have a right to be angry? Jonah, I have saved you. I have delivered you. I have rescued you. Do you not remember the fish? Yeah, I didn't think you'd forget about that incident. What right do you have to be angry that I chose not only to deliver you and save you and restore you, now I'm going to do it to somebody else. Have you not received something you didn't deserve from me, which is the definition of grace? Being given that which you do not deserve? Have I not done this for you? Why are you angry? Do you think you're the only one that's going to occupy heaven? Do you think you're the only one that I can choose to love? Why are you angry? I mean, is your happiness based upon you hoarding all the riches I could possibly give to humankind and you don't want to share that with anybody else? Is your happiness based upon things only going your way? Do you get sad when things don't go your way? Do you get sad that I choose to love your enemy? Because guess what? Have you failed to forget that you were once my enemy too? Why are you angry? It's like the person that we, we hear about on the news that may have been this, this serial killer spending time in prison ultimately goes to the, to the death chamber and at the final moments of their life they surrender their life to the Lord. And we sit there and go, whoa, whoa, they killed 20 people! They live a life of total wickedness. And they think they could, on their final moments, love Jesus? No way! And then I say, Yahweh. You guys knew that was coming, right? It's a little, little softball there for you. Because I'll tell you what. I sit there and go, I'm angry. Because guess what? I, I'm choosing to live my life as best as I can for the glory of God. And, and what do I get for it? 
And this person can live a heinous life of wickedness and in the last moments turn and God's going to accept them and God says, calm down, Morgan. Yes, I will love them. Why do we get angry? Because God doesn't live up to our expectations? Why do we get angry? Because we're keeping tabs on our performance, and when someone doesn't match our performance at the level we think they should live up to, that God's going to extend them the same grace that we've received. You're like, no, like God's got to have favorites, right? Like, look at me, God, am I not your favorite? And God says, anyone who believes in Jesus is my favorite. Whether you believe at the first hour or whether you believe at the 11th hour. See, we need to just stop and go, what makes us happy? Is it having health? Is it being married? Is it having a car that runs? Is it having a good job? Is it having three vacations a year? What makes you happy? What makes you sad? Because I'm going to tell you something. There's this guy named Job who in a moment had 1,100 livestock taken from him, seven sons taken from him, three daughters taken from him. And what does he do? He falls on the ground and worships and says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Yeah, that's the shut up moment. Right? Like God says, what do you have to be pissed off about? You have me. Is that not enough? Because we want God and, and, and plus something. God, I'll be happy if you've saved my wretched heart from hell and have fill in the blank. As if saving you from hell is not enough. Job has it. Jonah is learning it, we hope. The Bible never tells us if he gets it. You'll have to ask him in heaven one day, because guess what? He is in heaven, and if you get upset about that, we've got to go back to this conversation again. <laughs> what makes you happy? Is it seeing Jonah there? What makes you sad? Seeing Jonah in heaven? God's grace is a gift to you in the moment you think you've earned it and deserved it, you do not understand grace. But the moment you get it is the moment when you show unlimited grace to every single person you come in contact with. And even those you don't come in contact with. Because if you read the news tomorrow that ISIS all have turned their hearts to Jesus, how would your heart respond? Yeah, these are the men who are chopping off the heads of Christians. And some of you are like, you know, like, oh, don't remind me, I'm so angry at them. But if all of a sudden overnight God brought revival among ISIS and you woke up and it says, ISIS has turned their hearts to Jesus, how would you respond to that? Or would you sit there and go, God, I knew you would do that, I'm mad. They deserve to die. Well, so did you. Bring closer to home. Donald Trump decides to turn his heart to Jesus. Some of you, are you rejoicing? Hillary Clinton decides to turn her heart to Jesus. It's easy to lose sight of what is most important. Politics, policy, government, legislation. We live in a world where we're, we're shown things to be of the utmost importance, but what is of supreme importance that you, men and women of grace, do not withhold the grace you've received from anybody that needs that grace. Because you can pass legislation, but if your heart is damned, it is damned for eternity. Which brings us to the fact of God's sovereignty. Because look what God does. The master of object lessons. 
Jonah, you're angry? <laughs> Jonah went out from the city, makes a shelter for himself, sits down with his chips and dip, his nachos, his beer, under the shade, and he watches what's going to happen in the city. It's like one day he's in the city, he talks about the judgment of God, and he's like... <laughs> All of a sudden, he's hearing cries and mourning, and the more people love God, the more anger builds up in him. Odd picture, I know. And all of a sudden, verse 6, God appoints a plant to grow up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. Because guess what? It's the Middle East. It's hot. It's like Phoenix, right? And it's like, where's the shade? God sees him in his discomfort and provides a giant plant to grow up. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. Finally, we have a happy prophet. No more pouting prophet. Now he's happy. Why? Because his discomfort has been taken away. See, the discomfort was taken away by sea, the, the fish. Now the discomfort is taken away by the land. God grows this plant instantaneously. And it's not even like Jonah's sitting there going, how did you do that, Lord? Like all of a sudden, whoosh. He's only happy when it affects him personally. And God appointed a worm, verse 7. And when dawn came the next day, it attacked the plant and it withered. Oh no. Stop right there. What do you think is going to happen? Is he going to be happy or is he going to be sad? Happy, sad, right? The worm comes, devours the plant. And it came about that the sun came up and God appointed a scorching east wind. So it's, 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 it's by sea, it's by land, now it's by air. God is the God, creator, silver, sovereign over all things. He appoints this east wind to come. Probably like a big hair dryer, right? The sun beats down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all his soul to die, saying, death is better to me than life. Kill me now! See, this is where he failed to understand God's sovereignty. See, God's given him an object lesson. I am sovereign over the oceans. I can cause a storm to come like that. I am so for, so, uh, sovereign over all the, the sea life. I can uh, appoint a big fish to come and swallow you up. I, I'm sovereign over plant life. Right? I can cause a big plant to grow and provide you shade. I am I'm sovereign over the, the winds, and I can cause a wind to come in and, and bring you discomfort. You need to trust that I'm a God who's in charge of all things. When we fail to lose sight of God's sovereignty, that he is a God who can do whatever he wants, and he's too kind to be cruel, too wise to explain himself, and too deep to, make, uh, too deep to explain himself, too wise to ever make a mistake, we've got to trust that God. Let me say it again. He's too kind to be cruel, too wise to make a mistake, and too deep to explain himself. God owes you nothing. Can I go international? God owes you nada. <laughs> Amen? And yet he's once again hasn't learned the lesson of God's nature, God's grace, God's sovereignty. God won't act the way you want him to act. If you're expecting to do what he, you want him to do, he will never meet those expectations and you will be angry. Or you can choose to embrace him who is the Lord God of heaven and earth and will do whatever he does and whatever he does is for his glory. And you need to trust that. Because the last point is so key. He failed to understand God's mercy. The difference between grace and mercy is... Grace is being given that which you don't deserve. God sees you in, in, in your misery and he sees you in your discomfort and, and he gives you that which you don't deserve. Mercy is like the, the mother who cares for a child. It knows that the condition of, this, of, the, of the, the recipient of love can't do anything for themselves. And that's where God's merciful. Because look at what he says in verse 9, And God said to Jonah, Do you have a good reason to be angry about the plant? Again, back to the question that yet Jonah has not answered. He said, I have good reason to be angry, even to death. Like, give him props for being at least honest. 
Yeah, I'm angry. And then verse 10, another divine shut up moment. Only two books in the Bible end with a question, Jonah and Nahum. Both had to do with the people of Nineveh. Look at verse 9 and 10. I mean 10 and 11. And the Lord said, You had compassion on the plant for which you did not work, which you did not cause to grow, came up overnight and it perished overnight. You are concerned about the plant, an amoral object. And you had concern about it and you had nothing to do with it. And I have chosen to have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand as well as many animals? Divine mic drop. Boom. You care for something that doesn't matter in time and eternity. And you're angry because I'm caring for those that will live for eternity that I've shown compassion on them. And you want to know why I've shown mercy to them? Because there are people there who are ignorant of me. That's what that, they don't know the difference between their right hand and their left. They may make good decisions, but they're not good decisions when it comes to an eternal factor, when it comes to a God honoring factor. We live in a world where people are making dumb decisions. Would you not agree? There are many qualifiers for the Darwin of the Year Award every single day that we sit there and go, please, God, eliminate them. But there are people that make the decisions. Why? Because they don't have God. God is the answer. God is the solution. God is the reason. He is the way. And we get all concerned because our hard drive gets all busted up. And God says, really? Take that energy and channel it towards people. Hard drives come and go. Amen? You get upset because you blow a tire. Right? That's how I, that's how I express anger. I don't, I'm just, I don't know how you do it. You're like, more, more manly or, or more high pitch. I don't know. I'm like, Rah! We get angry, let's be honest, over the dumbest things. When will we get angry about the things that God is concerned about? God doesn't care about your computer. He doesn't care about your, 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 your car. He doesn't care if your air conditioning has just gone out, even though it's getting hot. He doesn't care about, he cares about people. And when the world sees that there are people that love him that show concern and mercy and compassion for, for people, that's when the world itself goes, wow. Are you concerned about the plants? Or are you concerned about the people? Are you concerned about things that don't matter in time and eternity? Or are you, matter, are you caring for the souls of men and women? Because there's only two things that will live forever. The word of God and the souls of men and women. That's it. Interesting, isn't it? Jonah. And you thought it was just about a big fish. <laughs> there's so much more here. God has the first word in Jonah. He has the last word in Jonah. Because he's a God who says, turn from your ways and love me. Because in the end, you have no reason to boast about your beginning and you have no reason to boast about your end. But in between those two things, you can live for his glory. If you know Jesus Christ, who again said, if you know me, you will be delivered just like Jonah was from drowning when that great fish came along. Well, that fish is representative of refuge. And Jesus says, for all of you who feel like you're drowning, turn to me. And that's my invitation to you guys. Start journeying with Jesus. And get over your anger. Stop pouting. Submit yourself to him who is too kind to be cruel, too wise to make mistakes, too deep to explain himself. Prayer is available for you if you desire just to just pray more. Maybe today's the day to say, God, 
Let me get over my anger. Because there's, there's a righteous anger where you get concerned about things going on in this world. And then there's the unrighteous anger, which has to do with our selfishness. And let's be honest, we're, we're mostly selfish. And it's time to think of others more important than yourself, especially those who don't know Jesus. Amen? Let's stand and let's pray. Mm, Father, this is such a, a difficult book to wrestle with. Lord, you've given us this, this account of Jonah, and it, I, I know in my own heart it's exposed a lot. Not that I'm just like this always angry individual, you know that, but there are little things that just take me off and I just sit there and go, God, help me to live more with, with the grace and live out of the mercy I've received from you to accept your sovereign dealings in this world, to be obedient to your call on my life, to, to love all people without prejudice, to, to be the one who just says, I've been loved with a great love, now I want to give that love to you. And not just to do it, but to do it wholeheartedly, Father. Forgive us for the ways we have had our pity parties and our woe is me sessions and, and help us to re, be restored and come back to that place where it's just, it is a great thing to be loved by you and to share that love with others. Renew in us a clean heart. Set us on a, on a path that leads to your glory and your honor and praise. Thank you for the lessons. Continue to apply them to our hearts and our minds so that we may live in a manner worthy of our calling in Christ Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Thanks, you guys. Have a great day. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord continue to lift his face towards you and give his grace, peace forever and ever. Amen. Pray over here. Pray over here if you need it. God bless you guys. See you soon.